Welcome to The Hair Loss Show. Dr. Russell Knudsen and Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash discuss issues relating to hair loss and the medical and surgical treatment of hair loss in both men and women. Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 28 of The Hair Loss Show. I'm Dr. Russell Knudsen. And I'm Dr. Vikram Jayaprakash. Welcome to today's episode, which we'll be talking about overseas clinics. So, um, look, Medical tourism is something that's been around for a long time and it's across a variety of different uh, uh, fields, uh, in dentistry and all across cosmetic surgery. And we're seeing more and more of that happen here in, uh, in hair transplant surgery. And what essentially uh, is happening is people are traveling overseas uh, to have their procedure done. And generally, the reason is financial. And curiously, people will email us or, or ring us or text us and ask us who we would recommend. And, uh, you know, that is uh, kind of a curious uh, question to have to answer. Uh, if, for example, I have a, a patient from um, an overseas jurisdiction that asks for advice to a trusted colleague, that's not a problem. I find it a bit more troubling when I have someone from Australia mm. asking me where they should go overseas because there are very good surgeons in Australia, not just in Melbourne. Uh, in other uh, areas of Australia as well. So uh, we want to talk you through the pros and cons, if you like, of what overseas clinics do. As Vikram said, it's usually about the money. Um, and traditionally, uh, people have been able to combine uh, an operation with a holiday because they look at the healing period, which is seven to 10 days, and they say, well, you know, if I can heal overseas while I'm on holiday, I come home after the holiday, no one's done. So, you know, particularly for men, this is more common for hair uh, loss uh, to go overseas for a transplant because it's secret men's business. They sure. don't really want people to know that they're doing it. So they can go away and hide and have it done and wait for the healing, the scabbing and the crusting, as I said, seven to ten days to settle before they come home. And that can be a really good option because generally speaking, hair transplantation is very safe, medically safe, generally speaking. If it's done in a quality institution by a quality doctor, and I'll repeat that, a quality institution by a quality doctor because sadly in recent years with the explosion of interest in hair transplantation a lot of less savory people have entered the market some of them not doctors we call these black market clinics because they don't use doctors in the process at all and that, that's particularly troubling to us because there's no attention there to the normal standards of medical safety guidelines and ethics um, but there are many great doctors overseas that mm -hmm. people will go to in other jurisdictions. For example, there may be people in Australia from Thai descent and they have family in Thailand and they want to go back to Thailand to see their family and have an operation. And Thailand has an excellent reputation for hair and other cosmetic um, uh, surgery. So I've been around for long enough to have had lots and lots of people um, uh, uh, come to me uh, and say, is there anybody good in Thailand? The worst example I had of the naivety of some of the people that want to go overseas was a, uh, I had a contact from um, a patient who came in to see me uh, some 10 years ago and he said, first thing I want to tell you, Dr. Nudson, is I can't afford you. Hmm. I said, okay, so where are we going with this? He said, so I've been in touch with a Thai clinic. And, um, and I said, okay, and what did they tell you? And they said, oh, they tell me I need 3,000 graphs. And I said, well, how did they decide that you needed 3,000 graphs. And he said, I sent photos. I said, okay, and who did you talk to? Did you talk to the doctor or did you talk to the manager or the salesperson? I, I don't know. I said, okay, so you, I said, so who, who is the doctor? And he said, oh, I, I don't remember. I said, well, where's the clinic? Is it in Bangkok or is it in Phuket or is it somewhere else, Pattaya? And he said, oh, I can't remember. I said, okay, so basically, You've been, you're going to a clinic who you don't know who the doctor is, you don't know who the, where the clinic is, you've sent some photos, you don't know who you talk to, you've been quoted 3,000 graphs, how can I help you? He said, well, I really don't know what's going to go on, so I thought you might like to explain it to me. Now, that's an extreme example. I'm not saying that people think like that, but some do. And they think that a hair transplant is such a simple procedure. But anyone can do it. It's plucking the yeah. little hairs out of the back, putting me in the front, anybody can do it. And they underplay the, uh, underplay the importance of the fact that this is cutting full thickness of the skin. So infection, 
you know, bleeding, swelling, all sorts of things can happen. And unfortunately, unfortunately, there have been some disasters around the world for what should be a simple and safe procedure. So when we talk about overseas clinics, it's very easy to stand here and, you know, it to be sort of um, trying to talk in our best interest. We're not saying that overseas clinics are bad. We know of lots of surgeons in various parts of the world that people may go, you know, Thailand, Turkey, India, fantastic surgeons who will do great job. Uh, a great job. That's not the problem. They're, you know, you can get great work done in a variety of clinics, and there are reasons, economic reasons, why you know surgery in in certain countries is more expensive than other other countries, and that's probably something that we can talk about on another episode. But the thing is, I want to say is that it's you know we don't generally have a problem with overseas clinics. We have a problem when patients are not managed correctly, and that starts right from the beginning. If you are being assessed and have a consultation, and it's not being done by a doctor, if it's being done by a salesperson, then they are only gonna be driven by the bottom line. They're only gonna be driven by trying to sell you the, um, you know, a, a, the maximum number of graphs that they can, they can offer you. They liaise with travel companies to offer these mm. travel packages. So that throughout Australia, they, the, the, the travel companies, you know, get the patients on board and send them over there. And on, oh yes, but they take great care of you. They give you a taxi to and from the mm. clinic. They book the hotel for you. They take you back to the airport, pick you up from the airport. That's the package, right? That's the sale. That's the sales point. But the, the reality is, the most important thing is who are you seeing and who's doing the operation. So there are a couple of factors that define the way overseas clinics generally would work. Okay, and again, I'm not saying this is a terrible thing, but you should be aware of it. So if you are flying 10, 12 hours uh, overseas to uh, have an operation, two things you should remember. Number one is they only ever expect to see you once. They don't expect you to do it again. So the corollary of that is that they're gonna give you as many hairs as they can so that you don't ring them six months later and say, I thought I was going to get more hair than this. So the, the tendency when you're dealing in that situation is to be overquoted rather than to be appropriately quoted and they have no expectation of seeing you again. Third thing you should remember is I can't remember the last time I saw a patient that came to see me that had been to an overseas clinic who had a discussion about medical treatment, who was put on medical treatment, who was told to stay on that medical treatment. The closest they ever came to is like, oh, when you go back to Australia, go and speak to the doctor. And well, no, they give them, uh, sometimes give them palmetto. Yes. Yeah, course, they'll give them a bottle course, of so palmetto. Yeah, sorpel a herbal matter. remedy, which doesn't work. Um, and so th th there is things you've got to remember here. Like, you know, the, for, for a patient, the best thing that can happen is to have a holistic experience with whichever doctor you go to. And that means he takes or she takes care of you medically, going forward, right, this is a progressive condition, and so surgery is part of the package, not the package. Hair loss is a journey, and you are, you know, surgery is one stop on that journey, and you need to have someone who's able to partner up with you in the long term for that. And if they're 10, 12 hours flying time away, then that's less likely gonna be, you know, a possibility there. And the other thing is, of course, and this is true, not just in overseas clinics, when you look at the before and after photos, I mean, they're not going to pick the average result, right? They're going to pick something that looks extraordinary. So if you can't see the person face to face beforehand and get a feel for what they're saying for you and what the realistic outcome is going to be. And remember, in a previous episode, we talked about the difficulty of, uh, of trying to quote people from photos or from FaceTime or mm -hmm. from Skype because you really can't see the quality and the amount of the donor hair. You can't really get a good view of um, uh, the hair loss, unless you're super bald, right? Then it's reasonably straightforward. But in, for areas of thinning, it's difficult to do the interpretation uh, from uh, photos uh, or videos uh, uh, with, uh, with video chats. So the bottom line is, really, you want to think very carefully. If you have another option, fine, but do your research carefully. But really, you want somebody to put eyeballs on you face to face to look at what's going on to work out what's the appropriate plan. I think the other thing as well to look at is, you know, we t you mentioned black market clinics as well. And this is where people are employing technicians to do the work. They're not medically trained. They don't have a medical license. They've just been trained in the technical aspect of that one particular procedure. 
And you know, with that comes all sorts of other problems as well. And so you're getting the unlicensed practice of, of medicine and surgery. And that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. So uh, the thing is, uh, the thing I'll say about that is that, you know, we've met a lot of people who have gone overseas and uh, had surgery and there are lots of people who have had a great result. But there are also people that have had less than stellar results. And I can tell you hands down that it is unbelievably difficult to correct a job that's been done Poorly. Because if you're going to laser them out, you're killing the hair and you can't use it again. If you're going to cut them out, you've got to try and do it in a way that allows them to move back to a more correct position but not leave you with visible scarring. So what we'll do is we'll, in the description, we'll link to another set of videos. So we had a patient, uh, and this is a really, this is an example, and again, this is not self-serving and this is certainly not a generalization, but we had a patient, uh, Ben, who traveled overseas and this is the thing, he, he had an online Skype consultation uh, with a uh, consultant uh, and then they just you know, bombarded him with emails, WhatsApp messages. They promised uh, to pick him up from the airport. His um, hotel uh, was included in the package and they offered him something called infinity graphs, which I, a term I had never heard of, which is basically as many graphs as you need to correct the area. In a single session. In a single session. Now, the problem with that is that this guy is very young and you take a, a large number of graphs, you're over harvesting the back. And so he had that uh, during the procedure. He didn't meet the surgeon uh, until five minutes before and the surgeon was only present for about 10 to 15 minutes of the surgery. There, was t there were technicians that were doing the procedure. Uh, he was in pain and didn't have any local anesthetic top up during the procedure. And then he came back after his surgery, six months after that, and he's got poor growth. Very poor growth, one uh, yeah, well, higher, higher than the other, and over-harvested from the back. And is now going, what do I do? I can't, they're not returning my call. Now, I agreed, and I want to say this again, this is not the norm, you know, not the norm. There are a lot of people that have been overseas and uh, had that experience, uh, had a good experience. But you don't want to be the one person that has a this is this is the emphasis on the black market clinic, right? Yeah. Because this was this was a, a sales hatchet, and he admits he was naive and desperate, and and uh, you know wanted to get it done in one session. So he'd been led to believe all his misconceptions were going to be correct. I just want to emphasise about techs or technical assistants. We all use them, okay? So in, in my surgery and Dr. Vikram's surgery, yes, we have technicians that assist us in the surgery. They do parts of it that are legally allowed to be done. So for example, they can, um, um, under the microscope, they can trim the grafts after we've cut them out. Um, they can insert the grafts into the incisions, but we make the incisions and we do the harvesting, right? That's the surgical part of the operation, making the recipient sign incisions and the harvesting, whichever technique, whether we do strip or FUE. So if you're going to ask any serious question about whether you've got a doctor involved in the process, you want to know who's harvesting the grafts from the back of the head and who is making the recipient sites. That is the two telling questions that will explain to you whether you're in a black market clinic or whether you're in um, you know, a conventional medical clinic where the surgeon is doing the work. And the thing, the other point to mention is, I mean, we've gone off a little bit on talking about black market clinics. Black market clinics are not, they only don't just occur overseas somewhere. No, they're, you know, they're spreading around the world. They're, they're everywhere. And we have them here in Australia, uh, you know, in Melbourne, in Sydney. We, you know, they're prevalent in the US, in the UK. So it's not something that happens I everywhere else. I have to mention the word else. Turkey. I don't really want to take, um, you know, uh, an, an aim at Turkey, but Turkey is where this problem exploded in the last 10 years. And every week people come in and say, oh, my mates went to Turkey, I just can't be bothered, or why would, shouldn't I go to Turkey? It's a question we get all the time. Are there some great Turkish colleagues? Absolutely, uh, that I know no. and respect. Uh, and I feel so sorry for them because only 10% of the clinics in Turkey, by our estimate, have a doctor involved in the process. 10% of the clinics. So if you do the math, and you're flirting with going to Turkey, there's a 90% chance you're talking to a clinic that has no doctor involved in the process. Now, this is spreading around the world, right? But that's probably the most concentrated market where we're having trouble finding the surgeons involved in the process. So 
It's not don't do it, it's just don't be naive and make sure you do your research. Yes, absolutely. Doing your due diligence is important. Again, you know, we, you know, uh, we understand the financial implications and what drives people to go overseas. And that's fine. We're not, you know, we're not for everyone. And this, is, this video is not um, intended to try and sort of get more people to come and see us in clinic. We just wanted to address the issue that there are such things as overseas clinics. Why they, you know, and the reason why they exist and what you should look for if you are going to under, uh, undertake that. One of the things I'm very proud of that we have over here, we have, you know, we are part of a, our patient's journey. So we see them before that, we will see them a number of times up until their surgery. We're involved throughout their, on their surgical process. We see them post-op. We, you know, we see them multiple times uh, in that post-operative phase. We even have an open door policy in our clinic. Right. Patients can come back and see us, you know, anytime as many times, any time they want, and they have our contact details, etc. But, you know, that's the kind of I would think the kind of um, interaction you'd want with someone who's uh, involved with uh, your hair yeah, restoration. I mean, procedure. I'm not special pleading for the doctors in Australia, but you know, one of the reasons we have high costs in Australia is not just because. We live in an expensive jurisdiction with you know, big rents and big costs. But also the medical regulations are very strict in Australia. So for Vikram and I, we can't register as medical practitioners in Australia unless we have medical indemnity insurance. And for someone who wants to practice hair transplantation, that's around about $30,000 a year. So the message is I can't even see one patient until I've paid my $30,000. So that means that's just that's the first expense, let alone the rest of the expenses that happens by, by practicing in Australia. So clearly Australia and New Zealand are going to be more expensive jurisdictions than some overseas because of a number of variety of reasons. But there are many countries overseas where there's no such thing as indemnity insurance for the doctors, which means that if you have a problem, good luck. Um, because there's no insurance to, uh, to, to cover for compensation. So. As I said, I'm not making a special pleading for me or Vikram mm -hmm. or even just the other doctors in Australia. I just want you to understand why there is such a differential price around the world. We're not the greediest doctors in the world. We just live in a, a specific environment that makes it expensive for us to practice. Well, that's a lot. Uh, and hopefully that's enough for you to uh, digest on, on that. So have a think about that. Do your due diligence and you know this is something that's going to live with you for the rest of your life so and you know, please don't be afraid if you've gone to an overseas clinic and you've come back and you're happy with the result and then you start to see um, you know and think about oh gee i better do something about stopping further hair loss please don't be embarrassed to come and see us yeah, or absolutely. other doctors about it you know if you said look you know i know that i've had my operation because that was what i needed to do but now i need to make sure i keep my hair we're very very happy to be involved in oh, the there's no judgment judgment at all is there no absolutely no 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 uh, and even if you know something wrong is going, you know we will do our best to try and and help correct as much as possible with that so there's no judgment across the board at all so hopefully you've uh, found that useful um, and please leave a comment uh, in the comments section uh, give us a like and uh, keep the subscriptions coming and we'll see you on the next episode thank you very much thanks